So for this presentation, I'm gonna to have to use the smallest pen size possible to hopefully fit every single one of these reactions into uh, one page for the stage three of, of glycolysis. And you may wanna watch this in full screen or if it looks bad or it looks small, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to try to upload this in 1080p and hopefully that's gonna look good. Anyways though, in the last video, we had just made two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate from the aldolase reaction. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, all two of them, are going to react with NAD+, an inorganic phosphate, and a unique little enzyme known as G3P dehydrogenase. What this is going to give us is, this is going to give us, as you can see, NAD+, well, it's going to be converted into NADH, um, H+, which we're not really I mean, what do you do about that? And then a compound known as 1,3-VPG. For NADH, two things can happen to it. It really just has two, I guess, things that it, fates it'll have to uh, go to, at least. It's going to go onto the electron transport chain, obviously, if we have oxygen available, or if we're some other organism that doesn't use oxygen for its final electron acceptor, um, it can use that, But or it can go on to play a role in fermentation, whether it be lactic acid fermentation or ethanolic fermentation. Let's try to circle my products in white. Uh, and then H+, plus, that's always just a, a result of our reaction. We're not really too... Uh, overly infatuated with that, but 1,3-BPG has an, a very important role in all of this. 1,3-BPG is actually in a higher energy molecule than ATP. If you had watched my previous video, I said that it, I would say that this has a higher phosphorylation potential, but I feel like that kind of is a the terminology tricks people up a bit, so I'm fine with saying that it has more energy than ATP. Essentially what we've done is we put a phosphate on the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and we've converted it into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Um, and so how do we do this? How do we make something that has more energy than ATP? Well, that's because of the enzyme G3P dehydrogenase. This time we're talking about energy, we're gonna be talking about a redox reaction, which you can tell just by looking at the NAD plus going to NADH that that was a redox reaction. But the way that we can synthesize something that's in such a high energy state, the way that we can do these type of reactions, is obviously to form a couple reaction. We're gonna to have to cover a favorable one with an unfavorable one, which is kind of one of the running themes of metabolism. The way that we do this is we're gonna couple the phosphorylation with the oxidation of our aldehyde. This isn't a, major, a majors course, so we're not really gonna go into the details of the actual mechanisms behind each and every one of these enzymes, but understand that the phosphorylation, that's the unfavorable one, and the oxidation is the favorable one. Yeah, the positive delta G for the phosphorylation. For the oxidation, the delta G value is negative. I'm not gonna write it out, but a small note that you may wanna make is that in this reaction, we have a thioester intermediate, and uh, that's really important in terms of catalyzing these reactions because thioesters are far less stable than regular esters for reasons that I don't want to explain. The reactions we're really going to have is, is not really so much the NADH and the H+, but 1,3-BPG reacting with ADP and phosphoglycerate kinase. So just so we said that this has more energy than ATP, well then obviously this can be used, and that's just kind of why some people use the term, has a higher phosphorylation potential, or phosphoryl transfer potential, to make ATP via means of substrate level phosphorylation. After I'm done circling the product and it leaves away, is a molecule of ATP and something else, something known as 3-phosphoglycerate. Now, keep in mind that this is the energy return stage for every two molecules, for every, sorry, uh, reaction that we do, we have two of these because we have two molecules of G3P at the beginning. So this is going to give us two ATP. So we've already paid off the energy that we borrowed at the very beginning of this. And what's going to happen next, though, is uh, the 3-phosphoglycerate is going to react in equilibrium with a mutase enzyme. Just in case I didn't say this earlier, the phosphoglycerate kinase is doing substrate-level phosphorylation. I, I made a video about this concept of substrate-level phosphorylation a very long time ago uh, for microbiology students. Um, you should, I think it's up there, I'll put a link in here if, I, if you're just that de desperate. If you don't know what substrate level phosphorylation is, basically we just make an ATP through a kinase enzyme. And the next type of uh, en enzyme that this, uh, crap, move away, 3-phosphoglycerate is going to react with is a phosphoglycerate mutase. And mutase are enzymes that basically just do an intramolecular functional group shift. In this context, we're going to be moving the phosphate group around because that's kind of the only variable amongst a lot of these things. So what do we get out of this reaction? Well, we're going to get 2-phosphoglycerate. 
And exactly what I said, we we're just with the mutase enzymes, we just are doing intramolecular shifting around of our functional groups. In this context, we're taking a phosphate from the third carbon and we're moving it to the second carbon. And as you can imagine, no ATP is used. We're not catalyzing ATP. ATP is off to be used for whatever reaction we needed at the time. That happens, and I really hope I have room to talk about this, or at least write it out, is um, Two phosphoglycerate is going to react with an enzyme known as enolase. The make out of this is two products. One of them is going to be water, and you know, water is pretty abundant. It's not a very unique compound. We're not worried about it. And another thing that we're going to make is phosphophenol pyruvate. And I just wanted to briefly mention what enolase does and what phosphoenol pyruvate is and, and why they're important. Enolase, as you can imagine, if we're taking water out of, or if we're getting water as a product, we're taking water out of something. We're taking the water out of the phosphoglycerate, so this is a dehydration reaction. What enolase does that really, I think, is, is, is unique, and if you remember, I think a long time back uh, in my organic chemistry videos, at some point, I think in the alkynes chapter or something, we talked about ketoenol tautomerization. The ketoenol tautomerization reaction is, is where you have a compound that is an enol, okay, an alkene alcohol, that is reacting in equilibrium with a ketone. And as I can, hopefully you see that I drew this, the arrow favoring the ketone at equilibrium. So we want to be in the ketone form, but what did we make? We made phosphoenol, you see that? Pyruvate. And so what we have done is we have essentially trapped it, this molecule, in the unstable enol form, how do we do that with the phosphate group? Now we didn't, we didn't use ATP in this process here because we already have the phosphate, but we're just going to take that, that phosphate that we have, we're going to move it to where we can actually lock it in the enol phase. And the enol phase is really unstable. If something is unstable, we can say that it has a lot of energy, that it's a reactive, that we can use it for something. I wrote that because of the phosphate, we are trapped in the enol form, which is why it's called phosphoenol pyruvate. And as we could imagine, this is unstable, and so this is a energetic species that we can use, and, and since it has a phosphate group to it, we could say that it has a high phosphoryl transfer potential. But I'm just going to say that it's energetic and unstable. Because it's unstable, it's going to react with something, and as I said earlier, whenever I say, whenever I mention pyruvate, or phosphophenol pyruvate, and 1,3-BPG, whenever I say they have more energy than ATP, or that this guy is unstable, that's just a scientific word for saying that it has a high phosphoryl transfer potential. It has the ability to translate, transfer a phosphate to something else. And in this context, it's going to react with an ADP molecule, um, arguably the ADPs that we had made in the stage one. What you'll notice is that this is not an equilibrating reaction. While all these other ones were, this one is not. And so we're going to be reacting with the enzyme known as pyruvate kinase, which is substrate level phosphorylation, in case that wasn't uh, obvious to you. We're going to be making ATP. You may want to take note of the fact that this is not an equilibrating reaction. And one of the things that I said was that equilibrating reactions, or sorry, irreversible reactions, non equilibrating liberating reactions are major sites of regulation. So pyruvate kinase is another major site of regulation. It's the only major regulatory site that we have in stage three. But now that we have made pyruvate and ATP, and keep in mind that we have two molecules of G3P at the beginning. So we made two here. We already paid off the energy that we had borrowed, and we just made two here. So we have a net gain of two ATP. Here's where it gets kind of interesting, is what happens next to pyruvate depends on, one, the structure, function, and metabolism of your cell, and two, the environment that the cell is in. Pretty sure I spelled the word aerobic wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm really shitty at that. But <laughs> if it has an aerobic environment, it has access to oxygen, what's going to happen to pyruvate is that it's going to go on and it's going to take part in the electron transport chain in the citric acid cycle. What are the earlier steps of that? What's going to react with CoA and NAD+, and it's going to um, result in the production of acetyl-CoA, NADH, and CO2. All right, and then that is going to go on to um, you know, the other parts of the Krebs cycle and then the electron transport chain. Now let's mention what would happen if it were under anaerobic conditions, collectively known as fermentation. There's really two fates of pyruvate under anaerobic conditions, which you probably are familiar with the end products, but probably not the steps in between. And hopefully I have room to fit this 
although I'm kind of afraid that I may not. In the first pathway, it's going to react with an enzyme known as pyruvate decarboxylase. Pyruvate decarboxylase and some acidic conditions, because pyruvate, as you can imagine, and a lot of these things that I'm saying that are ending in eight here, these are just the conjugate bases of acids. This is gonna give us CO2 and acetaldehyde. The acetaldehyde is gonna go on to react, and the CO2 is from the pyruvate decarboxylase, you know, the COO end of the carboxylase, group, and then the acetaldehyde is going to react with NADH and an enzyme known as alcohol dehydrogenase to give us the wonderful thing known as ethanol. This gives us ethanol, drinking alcohol, you know, and then NAD plus, and I'll explain why we just made NAD plus in a minute. The other fate for anaerobic fermentation is to go ahead and have NADH and lactate dehydrogenase to react with pyruvate as well. So yeah, pyruvates in, in this context, my like my cells, for example, are going to react with NADH and lactate dehydrogenases dehydrogenase, sorry, under anaerobic conditions. This is going to give us, or it's going to yield NAD+, plus, we're familiar with that already, and something known as lactate, hence the name lactate dehydrogenase is named after the reverse reaction. Now, lactate can be metabolized by the liver to make more ATP. What I think is interesting is that we just made NAD+, plus, and the reason why both these pathways make NAD+, plus, and they both end up making something that's really not that beneficial for the cell, ethanol isn't that great for the cell, and uh, too much lactic acid is not good for your cells. If you've ever been running and you had a muscle cramp, you know what that is. Um, but what this is, if we could apply this to Le Chatelier's principle, this makes a lot of sense. What is the connection that this has, this NAD plus, to Le Chatelier's principle, and how is this energetically favorable for certain cells? Okay, so understanding, let's just say, you know, I don't know, a hypothetical situation that I am running, and yes, for those of you who are big on anatomy and physiology, uh, we do have certain types of muscle fibers that are really adapt to produce a lot of ATP. But if I keep running, eventually I'm going to have such a metabolic demand that the ATP need is not met through my electron transport chain that I'm going to have to start switching my metabolism over to using anaerobic, in this context, lactic acid fermentation, but it, the same thing can apply to plants, except they don't work out, but that's a different story altogether. But I need to make ATP, right? No matter what, I have to make ATP. And I'll do that at the expense of making my, you know, things to become, my surroundings to become acidic. So Le Chatelier's principle plays into this. And the reaction that this plays into is this one right here where we talked about the 1,3-BPG um, undergoing a specific type of reaction. So what we are doing in this is we are removing the product. We're removing NADH and we're producing NAD+. And what this is going to give us is what we're essentially going to be doing is we're going to be making 1,3-BPG. And 1,3-BPG has more energy than ATP. It has a higher phosphoryl transfer potential than ATP. So this reaction will always give us the means to make more ATP. And so that's this first step here. <laughs> it is not just important in glycolysis, but it's also drastically important in anaerobic uh, fermentation, lactic acid, and ethanolic fermentation. And that's how we can make ATP. 